Well, I don't know about you, but I love bagels. I mean, with a little cream cheese and lox, delicious. But can you imagine keeping a bagel around for a hundred years? Don't even think of biting into it. But I want you to know about a 100 year old bagel that tells a story of a caring mother from Atlanta who packed a dozen bagels in her son's army knapsack around the year 1898 and sent him off to fight in the Spanish-American War. That's long before my time. It's one of the incredible stories from an amazing exhibit at the William Bremen Jewish Heritage Museum in Atlanta along a very busy Spring Street in Midtown. The exhibition is called History with Chutzpah, Remarkable Stories of the Southern Jewish Experience, 1733 to the Present. I'm Audrey Galix, Director of Community Engagement for the AIB Network. We're delighted to bring you just a taste of these remarkable stories, not the whole bagel, in this partnership between AIB Network and the Bremen Museum. In this edition, stories of patriotism and perseverance. First, a word about the word chutzpah. Chutzpah, what is chutzpah? So chutzpah is one of those words that depending on what generation you're a part of has a different meaning. I am Leslie Gordon. I'm executive director of the Bremen Jewish Heritage Museum here in Midtown Atlanta. You see, Yiddish is the language historically spoken by the Jews of Eastern Europe and by many Jews who immigrated to the United States after the turn of the 20th century. It's a mix of Hebrew and German, written in Hebrew letters. Chutzpah really means guts, or nerve, or moxie, or really, really uh, the real ability to just push your way through and into something. Because it's one of those things where people say, oh, you'll never do that, and it gets done. Those people have chutzpah. But a few generations back, for some, having chutzpah wasn't kosher. At least, not like it is now. Now, chutzpah had a negative connotation way back when, because people thought it meant, oh, you're care you, you don't care about people, you're just so pushy, you're aggressive. But these days, it's come around, and even the Harvard Business Review and Fast Company talks about chutzpah as the new charisma. Most of the items in the History with Chutzpah exhibit are preserved here the Ida Pearl and Joseph Cuba Archives for Southern Jewish History, housed at the Bremen Museum. My name is Casey Fishman, and I'm the Archives Director here at the Bremen. We have hundreds of artifacts and textiles. We have over 2,000 manuscript collections. We have over 1,000 oral histories, which document the stories of Holocaust survivors and their families, as well as important people in the Jewish communities um, in Georgia and Alabama. and. Um, over 40,000 photographs. But let's face it, photos and memorabilia aren't just evidence of days gone by. We have stories through our oral history collection and we have photographs and we have artifacts and together all of those things create something really tangible. Um, so if someone tells a story but then we also have a photograph to go with it and maybe a uniform that somebody wore, then it really creates a complete picture and brings history to life um, in a really unique way. And that's exactly what the co-curators, Jane Levy, the museum's founding executive director, and Sandy Berman, the founding archivist, had in mind. If you have an object, for instance, an object that's in this exhibition, like a plate or a deck of playing cards or a dental drill. You don't know why those objects are important to the history of Jewish life in a community unless you know the story behind that object. So it was our goal to tell the stories through these objects so that the objects become more than just a three-dimensional item. Before there were archives, before there were museums, Many people kept their private collections, well, private, in rooms like this one. Their curiosities stored on shelves or in so-called curiosity cabinets. But I gotta hand it to museums like the one here at the Bremen that have made these private collections, well, public for all of us to see. You know, thank goodness times have changed. 
So, well, I don't know about you, but I'm ready to go see some history with chutzpah. So, what's a story about a petrified bagel doing and a display about patriotism and perseverance? His name was Sam Greenblatt. He was only 16 years old at the time he enlisted, underage, so he lied about his age, and his parents were alarmed, as any parent would be, but um, they didn't want to say that he lied because then they, they thought that he would get into trouble. So instead, she, his mother, packed him some bagels to take with him in his rucksack to the Spanish-American Moor, and he ate 11 of the bagels. And on his return, as they were unpacking the rucksack, they discovered one last bagel. If that solitary bagel could talk, it would tell a dramatic story of the Spanish-American War, a war sparked by the Cuban struggle for independence from Spain in 1895. Eye-catching headlines fanned the flames of American sympathy for the Cuban rebels. And then came the sinking in Havana Harbor of the USS Maine. The U.S. Congress demanded Spain withdraw and authorized the use of force. Spain declared war, but the Spanish were outgunned. The Treaty of Paris ended the fighting on December 10, 1898. It also closed the book on four centuries of Spanish colonial rule in the Americas and gave the United States territories in the Western Pacific and Latin America. All that, a history lesson, baked into a bagel, preserved by a family for six generations. I think by keeping it in a safety deposit box where there's no humidity, no light, it just survived. And it's like a rock now. It's, it's just, I mean, we never opened the container. Still looks like a bagel, though. Still looks like a bagel. Our next story takes us to the commemorative Air Force Air Base in Peachtree City, Georgia. It's a story about Evelyn Greenblatt Howren, the daughter of Sam Greenblatt of the Petrified Bagel. You see, against her parents' wishes, Evelyn took flying lessons and then became a member of the WASP, the Women's Air Service Pilots. Come here, I wanna show you something. And she may have flown a plane like this one. It's a PT-19. This particular plane is obviously being remodeled, not just to look like it once did, but to fly. It was assigned to be flown by the Tuskegee Airmen, the famed Tuskegee Airmen, and it's believed that a WASP ferried the plane from the manufacturer in Maryland to the airfield in Alabama. Maybe, just maybe, that might have been Evelyn Greenblatt Howren herself. She, from an early age, um, had a love of flying. I mean, she just wanted to be an aviatrix. And um, she went to her parents and asked if she could take flying lessons, and they said no. And so she somehow um, earned enough money to take flying lessons. And she, when um, war broke out, or even before, in 1941, she joined the Civil Air Patrol. And in 1942, she joined the Women Air Service pilots, to, that we know them as the WASPs. And um, very few women were in that organization. They were not really um, a branch of the government. They were a civilian branch. According to the National Museum of World War II Aviation, during the war, some 25,000 women applied for admission to the WASP training program, but only 1,074 completed the course. Their training was nearly identical to male pilots, except for the combat-related portion of instruction. What WASPs did, and it was an extremely important role that they played, they freed up military pilots, combat pilots, from transporting goods and troops so that they could do combat assignments. So it was a very important role that they played. And she was really remarkable. It was not something you would say a Jewish woman at that time would have um, gotten involved in. While the WASP was deactivated in December 1944, their stories live on at the National WASP World War II Museum in Sweetwater, Texas. And then after the war, she opened a flying school with her husband. So um, 
she, she was really remarkable. In fact, we have a photograph of her. We have another story in this exhibition about Lovable Brazier, a company that was founded in um, Atlanta by Frank Garson. They was, became an international uh, garment, brazier and girdle manufacturer. But Evelyn Greenblatt, um, we have a photograph of her in her plane with a lovable sash across her this advertising for a lovable brassiere. And in 1977, WASPs were granted veteran status. And in 2009, they were awarded the Congressional Gold Medal. Evelyn Greenblatt Howron wasn't the only World War II era pilot to be featured in the History with Chutzpah exhibit. This dive bomber, better known as the Dauntless, was a kind of plane flown by Cecil Alexander. That's right, the acclaimed Atlanta architect and civic leader. The Dauntless was one of the aircraft that was credited with the U.S. victory over the Japanese during World War II. It was considered a ship killer, and Cecil Alexander flew 60 bombing missions during the war in the Pacific. He said it was an experience that changed his life and his view of war. Cecil Alexander nicknamed his dive bomber Hermie the Swoos in honor of his wife, Hermoyne. He shared his war stories with Sandy Berman in a 2009 oral history interview found on the Bremen website. Instead of doing that to dive, which would bring you up out of your seat, you'd go weightless. We'd roll over and go in like that from about 10,000 feet. And dive, we were supposed to dive at about 70 degrees, but the wind would be a big influence and sometimes we had to do that if the wind was blowing us back or we'd go around the other side. And at about 1,500 feet, we'd release the bomb. He described the bombing mission that shaped his attitude on war. We went to a cloud bank and then we turned and came back. And as we approached the atoll, there was a large launch had put out into the lagoon. And uh, I dove on it, and we had two 50 caliber machine guns that fired through the propeller in very slow rate of fire, and they jamming all the time in my, as I was in the dive, they jammed. We carried on these searches, we carried depth charges for anti-submarine, but they could be fused to go off on contact with the water or anything on the surface. And I flipped the switch to arm these things for that. And I was down around 500 feet under heavy fire from the atoll. And I dropped these depth charges. And as I was diving, I was looking through the windshield and I could see these, there must have been 20 or 30 men on this launch looking up. They didn't have any guns, but uh, I dropped the bombs and I, or the depth charge and I pulled up and looked back and there was nothing there but an oil slick on the water. And that stayed with me all these years. For his heroism, Alexander was twice awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. He also made his mark on the Atlanta skyline as an architect, and he helped change Georgia's political landscape. Alexander co-chaired Congressman John Lewis's first campaign for Congress, then co-founded the Black Jewish Coalition with him. He's also known for redesigning the Georgia state flag to remove the Confederate battle flag. While not a flag, a rather unusual banner hangs in the exhibit. It tells a story of bigotry. Everybody who comes on tour in this exhibition asks me why are there four Ks? Because they think of the Ku Klux Klan, they don't know that it was originally, or the proper name was the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. The Kalatka family, which um, today descendants still live in Atlanta, um, wanted to open a store in Gainesville, Georgia. Um, north, which is in the north of the state. Um, it was a hotbed of Klan activity. Um, and one morning, before the store was open, this banner telling them to get out of the state or get out of the area was left across their 
unopened, still unopened store. They saw the writing on the wall. They packed up their possessions. They packed up the banner, took it back with them, and moved to Atlanta, um, which did not see as much Klan activity in, in Atlanta. And um, so, but they kept the banner all these years. And um, when we opened the, ar we started the archives, it was donated to, to us. And it's a, it's a really important piece of history because um, these hate groups like the Klan, like some of these, the Colombians that came along later, some of the states' rights parties, the, the Christian anti-Jewish um, party, uh, they all morphed from one to the other. And so when the Klan activity died down, or maybe some of the states' rights parties died down, these, a lot of these same individuals moved on to similar organizations that really had the same kind of um, goals, um, anti-Jewish, anti-black um, agendas. Demonstrating patriotism and perseverance doesn't just mean going off to foreign shores and fighting in wars. It can mean confronting hatred and anti-Semitism right here at home, sometimes in our own neighborhoods. One of the people profiled in the exhibit is someone who confronted homegrown hatred. In fact, attorney Morris Abram is known as the man who unmasked the Klan. Morris Abram was born in 1918 in Fitzgerald, Georgia. Um, and that's kind of a, in middle Georgia. Um, and he grew up there and went on to a law school at the University of Chicago, came back to Georgia, I believe in the 1940s, and then became um, the chief counsel to the director of the, the of the ADL and Anti-Defamation League and started to write laws that would curb Klan activity. He wrote a pamphlet that would um, help to sp spread the idea that we needed to curb Klan activity. Because of his work on developing anti-Klan legislation and also writing this pamphlet, five states across the South enacted laws that would no longer al allow for Klansmen to remain hidden behind their hoods. And so he is known as the man who unmasked the Klan. Attorney Morris Abram also left his mark on voting rights and international human rights. He served as a U.S. Supreme Court associate to the chief prosecutor at the Nuremberg trials of Nazi war criminals. And he argued the case that led to the U.S. Supreme Court ruling affirming the principle of one man, one vote. In the 1950s, a young cardiologist, Nanette Wenger, was working at Grady Clinic when she spoke out against segregation and discrimination. We had a chance to sit down and talk to her about how she found the courage to confront a culture of bias. In 1954, Dr. Nanette Wenger became one of the first women to graduate from Harvard Medical School. In 1958, she was appointed chief of the segregated Grady Hospital Clinic. Photos and her stethoscope are included in the exhibit. And at that time, patients were summoned to the room by calling them on the public address system. And we had two sides of the clinic. The, the Grady Hospital is still built like an H. The front part was the white hospital and the back part was the black hospital. And the patients were called and the white patients were called Mr. or Mrs. and the black patients were called by their first name. And you know, we, we all have a set of core values and I found this unacceptable. And I basically instructed my staff that they would call all their patients Mr. and Mrs. And you might anticipate that the next Monday morning I was in the office of the hospital director, who was one of the good old boys, but I think who saw the handwriting on the wall. And he said to me, Dr. Wenger, and I sort of listened at that because I was used to being Dr. Cass. So this Dr. Wenger was a new person to me. Dr. Wenger, do you know what you've done? And I said, yes, sir. 
And he said, do you know it's against the rules? And I said, yes, sir. He says, do you know, it? Probably some people would say it's illegal. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, will you do it again? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, we're gonna become good friends because you're gonna be down here very, very often. And after this had happened for several weeks, he and I both wearied of it. And he said, I think I have a solution. And there was one cafeteria where everyone ate. Actually, there are two cafeterias, a black cafeteria and a white. But in the white cafeteria, everyone was there, the physicians, the staff, the nurses, etc. And the two of us stood in a line for our food, and he put his arm around my shoulder. Today, that would have been totally unacceptable. But then, the message was clear. Don't bother reporting her, nothing is going to happen. And that ended that. Dr. Wenger went on to become a Grady legend, a beloved physician and mentor. She also has been a pioneer in the detection and treatment of heart disease in women. Between 1948 and 1961, some 65% of the Jewish students in Emory University's now closed dental school were confronted by some pretty open discrimination. They were good students. But some of them were given failing grades, made to repeat a year of class, and some were even told to leave the school. Emory University long ago issued a formal apology and established a special scholarship in Jewish studies. But it did so only after one of those former students, Perry Brickman, had to go elsewhere to become Dr. Perry Brickman. He did some digging and refused to remain silent. And it always bothered Perry what had happened to him to what had happened to him and what had happened to all of his, so many of his classmates. And so he came actually to me, to the archives, and that's when it all kind of coalesced for him because in the archives, we had all of the records of the Jewish Community Council, which was the part of the Atlanta Jewish Federation that investigated what was going on at the dental school. Among the documents that Dr. Brickman uncovered was the application used for admission to Emory's Dental School, which asked students not only their religion, but their race, the options Caucasian, Jew, or other. The dean who had added that category was one Dr. John Bueller. Dr. Ronald Goldstein did pass, but I re he recalled um, that Dean Bueller told him that it was Jewish, the Jewish men's hands that weren't able to make the dentiforms, the molds, as well as some of the other, other dentists. Dr. Brickman's book, Extracted, and a documentary film he spearheaded, reveal sad personal stories of the students who suffered. Both also disclose how the Atlanta Jewish community tried to confront Emory administrators, along with the school's disappointing reaction even after Dean Bueller resigned in 1961. To everyone's dismay, Emory categorically denied all charges, labeled them trivia, and said that Dr. Bueller could have stayed if he had wished to. Some 50 years later, Dr. Brickman persevered in the quest for truth, unearthing undeniable evidence of systemic discrimination, documents and testimonies that tell a very human story. The late John Lewis was not afraid to open his mouth and speak out against discrimination. The U.S. congressman from Georgia is quoted as saying, never ever be afraid to make some noise and make good necessary trouble to fight injustice. John Lewis is not part of the History with Chutzpah exhibit, although he certainly demonstrated chutzpah. But he inspired and he mentored a young John Ossoff, now Senator John Ossoff, who is. Years ago, John Ossoff interned in Lewis's Washington office, so it's no mystery that some of his key issues focus on fighting corruption and championing equal justice. We wanted to include John Ossoff because, um, one, what a patriotic story to become uh, at such a young age a United States Senator and to want to serve your country in that way. Um, and secondly, because he was the first Jewish senator from the Deep South since 1879, um, which is again remarkable. He's only 33 years old and so he is the youngest United States senator that we have in Congress today. 
The exhibit shows that Senator Ossoff is no newbie to politics. It also includes the printed Hebrew Bible on which he placed his hand when it's worn in, a chumash that once belonged to Rabbi Jacob Rothschild of the Temple, a rabbi known for his steadfast commitment to civil rights. And like that rock-hard bagel, they're among the hundreds of mementos that remind us to remember. When you make a mark on history, when you make a mark on a community, your story shouldn't be forgotten. And families, you know, descendants die, and after a number of generations, without museums, without archives, um, those stories would be lost. And so it's, it's a tribute to all of these people who, who really made an impact on Atlanta, Georgia, Alabama, and um, should be remembered. These remarkable stories of patriotism and perseverance move and inspire us, even when they're more than 100 years old. And what we do today is history tomorrow. So we might as well make history with chutzpah.